Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of The Roosevelt Story, brought to you by the Roosevelt Presidential Library and Museum here in Hyde Park, New York. I'm Jeff Urban, the Education Specialist, and today we're going to be talking with two talented filmmakers who have created a short animated film titled The Girl with the Rivet Gun. It's uh, entertaining. It's innovative, and most importantly, it's very informative. Uh, it tells the story of women the, who were so-called Rosies the Riveters during the uh, Second World War, and um, it, it it goes beyond the you know, idealized version of the Rosies that you see, and we talk about it with the posters, to uh, a deeper understanding of who these women were, what motivated them, and what drove them. Um, so here to talk with us today are Anne DeMair and Kirsten Kelly. The filmmakers. Hi, you guys. Thanks for joining Hi. us. Hello. Oh, thank you for having us. Oh, we're delighted. I'm so happy that you could uh, get here today and um, and chat with us. Um, I want to start off by just asking, you know, how did you uh, get interested in, uh, in in the the work of the uh, and the story of the wartime uh, women workers? Well, it's interesting. We had been working. Uh, we had been working with a producer named Elizabeth Hemmerdinger, who was uh, working on a script for a musical based on Rosie the Riveter. And through that work, we started to hear stories about, you know, people would say, oh, my grandma was a Rosie, my aunt was a Rosie, uh, my next door neighbor was a Rosie. Um, and we started hearing, understanding that the stories were much more complex and diverse than we understood before. Um, and then we worked with uh, New York University Libraries to do uh, capture some oral histories for them. And as we got deeper and deeper and talked to more and more women, um, we sort of became fascinated with this idea of how many of these stories hadn't been told. Um, that we all, as you said, we remember the sort of the poster, um, but that really working class women from all over the country, very different backgrounds, um, very different economic situations uh, had been Rosie's and had had this moment that really affected their life uh, for the rest of their life. So that's how we got into it. And what, what makes the story of the Rosies, you know, so, so compelling? Well, I think it's that there was this window in history that, um, that what happened during the Second World War was that the, a window opened for women to be employed in a way that paid them almost as much as men were earning. Um, a chance to enter the workforce and work both with men and with people of other races, which is something that hadn't happened before. Um, and the war effort sort of tore down a lot of societal boundaries for that moment. And so consequently, the women's lives were sort of forever changed by that. Um, and of course it was a window. Uh, and when the war was over, many things returned back to the way that they were, but the, the children of the generation of Rosies were actually the women of sort of the second women's rights movement in the 1970s, so 60s and 70s. So it's an interesting um, parallel. Yeah, and I would say that, you know, it, it was the first time it, we kept hearing time and time again, we interviewed, oh, I think, 47 women for this oral history project. And just hearing the amount of pride, not just the fact that they were helping with the war effort, but this fact that they were taking own their own paycheck home, that they were able to travel for the first time, kind of either by themselves or with other groups of women to different cities and factories. Um, it just kind of opened all of these doors in a way of possibility. And I think even talking to the 80 year old, you know, women in their 80s and early 90s, which was such a special time in these interviews, um, as they were recounting this memory, just the amount of energy and vivaciousness that they all had in terms of connected to in this moment was really incredible to experience as filmmakers. That's great. Um, I, I like the idea of the energy because that really comes through, um, you know, in the film, not only in the stories, but also in the, the medium and the format that the story um, yeah, is told. So let's give our audience a little sneak peek at, um, at the uh, film that you guys have put together. We're going to show us a short clip and um, folks can get a sense of, of what exactly we're talking about. This is Mrs. Franklin D. Roosevelt's regular Sunday evening broadcast at 6.45 Eastern War Time. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. At the present time, it is of paramount importance that the women and girls of our country 
be given training so that they may do their share in the war emergency. Hundreds of girls are gaining experience and training in sheet metal work. Such training is essential for many jobs in aircraft and other war industries. The picture was taken outside of Gus Sachs machine products in Long Island City. And I'm dressed in my work clothes. The first apartment I was sent into, I stood at a kick press. There were machines here, you felt like you could do something. The uh, drill presses and the lathe and the screw machines and the milling machine all had big belts with the pulley on the ceiling, flapping noise. My then husband went into the service six months after Pearl Harbor. And many of the young women were in the same position. I was living with my sister at the time. I'd come home from work and she said, number one, you stink. Get out of here, take, go take a shower. You work in a spray of turpentine or something. You cleaned yourself with motor oil at the end of the day. But you felt you were doing it for the war, you know? I was seeking employment because I really wanted to be a, a nurse or a teacher. I said, I'd seen enough young mothers with a house full of babies. So two other girls and I went to what we called the Defense Training School. And that landed us in the old uh, Chevrolet plant, uh, Riveting. That's how Rosa the Riveter came into my life. At that time, it wasn't important except that we were riveters and we were doing something and making more money than anybody in our family. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, on the surface, it, it really does just seem like it's women going into the into the workforce and into the factories. And collectively, we call them, you know, Rosies, the Riveters, uh, you know, which is which is cute. But, um, you know, after we, we get the work out of them and the war is over, we expect them to go, um, you know, back to their to their old lives and back to their old um, you know, way, way of being. So um, what did the women tell you about about that experience? Do you want to take that one, Kirsten, or do you want me to sure, take it? I can, <laughs> sure, I can jump in. Um, you know, I think what was incredible about interviewing so many women was, you know, really giving the moment that each person's story is different, right? And, you know, we had looked at this time in history, and I know that certainly I learned a little bit about it in terms of World War II history, but not to the complexity, obviously, that something like these longer interviews or this project can bring in terms of untold stories in history. So in terms of that moment, I mean, there was, you know, a lot of pain with that in terms of that transition, you know, to sort of feel like coming back into the home and you're kind of identity being again um, narrated for you. Um, I think a lot of women had um, struggled with that a lot. Um, some didn't, you know, some really used it at the, as this moment in time. Um, but I, I think it, it really, you know, that, that frustration I think generated a lot of um, attention to the next generation, making sure education became very important for so many of these women to bring to their daughters specifically. You know, the college education, um, really helping their daughters sort of um, know that there's opportunities and that that opportunity, you know, brought freedom with it. Uh, and just to add a little specificity, like there was a woman that we interviewed, the very first woman we interviewed, talked about how the fact that it was the very first job she'd had doing something that she enjoyed doing. 
Um, and I thought that, you know, women have always worked. There's this mythology that, oh, it was the first time women entered the workforce. It's like women had always worked. Um, but the jobs that were available to women were a lot of cleaning, cooking, housekeeping, taking care of children, laundry, um, school teaching. But there weren't a lot of jobs where you could actually make something. And this particular woman loved being a machinist. Um, and when the war was over, she had to give that job up. And she was very sad about that. And now there were other women that we interviewed, including one that you'll meet uh, when you when we watch the next clip, um, who really looked at the work as an opportunity to pay for education to do something different. Um, so Mrs. King, who you'll meet in the next sequence um, that we show a little later on, um, you know, paid her way through college on her rosy salary, um, which is something that she never would have been able to do if she hadn't been earning the, the amount of money that she was earning as being a rosy the Riveter. Um, and I just want to um, also mention there's an interesting there's an interesting thing about the economics of it, which is that, you know, it was a very interesting point in American labor because women historically earned less money than men doing almost everything. And that was definitely the case for the Rosies. In fact, a number of the stories that we encountered were women going to their bosses saying, wait a minute, the men are earning this much and I'm only earning this much. What's going on? However, in a lot of the factories, the unions didn't want to undercut the wages that the men were earning before the war, because they didn't want the industries to be able to hire people at, at a lower rate. And that's the reason why you had this weird window, right? Where where women were earning so much more than they'd ever earned before, the prejudice was still there and the sort of gender inequality and in the paychecks, but it was this really interesting moment because if you start paying a welder, you know, a fourth of what you're used to paying them, when the men come back to the work, the industries aren't gonna to wanna to pay them their, their rate wages. So it was this really unique situation. Yeah, yeah, I think that's the thing that's so fascinating about the story is that there are so many of these sort of social, uh, economic, um, you know, prejudicial undercurrents that, that go through all of this. And, you know, it's always just been presented as this, you know, Rosie's, you know, to, you know we can do it, you know, uh, sort of thing. Um, I, I like the idea that you talk about the, the sense of accomplishment, because I think, you know, so much of, of women's work, such as it is, um, you know, was, was really, um, and still is, um, underappreciated, you know, I mean, you just sort of take for granted that, you know, the meals are going to be cooked, the clothes are going to be done, you know, that, the, you know, uh, that, you know, if you're a teacher or, or a nurse, you know, the traditional jobs for women, um, you know, sometimes you didn't really see, I mean, obviously the patients would get better, the students would learn, but you didn't really see the payoff that you saw, um, you know, with the Rosies, you know, where you're, you're, you're walking in in the morning and, you know, two days later, a plane is rolling out uh, of the, of the factory. That must've been a tremendous uh, sense of accomplishment for these for these women. Oh, absolutely. And they all talk about it so fondly. Yeah. 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 I mean, some of them so personally, you know, we will see Mildred um, introduced a little bit later. Um, and she in the film really talks about having this personal relationship with her airplane. Like she, she riveted on specific airplanes that were then used. And she felt this tremendous amount of pride. And You'll see a special story in the in the film about you know what happened to some of the airplanes when they became broken and how this broke her heart. She took it very personally. <laughs> That's incredible. Now these women, um, how did you? You say you interviewed about forty six or or almost fifty women. How did you narrow that down? What were you looking for in in the particular stories that that made it into this film? Because the audience should know the film itself is only about 20, 22 minutes long, um, but it covers a great a great deal, and you really have have captured um, you know some important important points with these women that you you have in the film. How did you narrow it down from the forty six to to this you know four or five? It was hard. I mean. Um... And there are so many stories that aren't in the film, but we really wanted to choose women from very different parts of the country who had very different experiences. But most of the most of the women and the women's stories in, in this film are centered around these ideas of, um, of sort of gender inequality, racial inequality, this idea of diversity in the rosy, in the rosy kind of workplace. And so that we, w we wanted to give people an understanding that these were women that came from, you know, the country, they came from the city, they came from the north, they came from the south, they came from 
Um, they were there were black rosies, there were white rosies, there were you know there was a there was a huge they were representative of the American people um, in this way that we don't tend to think about right. History gets written and we remember the one symbolic image of the rosy um, from that Westinghouse poster. And in all honesty, like there was no there were no places that Rosie didn't reach into. There were grandmothers who were Rosie the Riveters. Um, there were the, most of the women that we interviewed because we did the interviews in, you know, 2010 and 2011, um, had been young women at the time. Um, and they were obviously not young women when we interviewed them, um, which was sort of the other wonderful thing was to be able to capture these stories while these women were still alive. Um, because you, we really did get the feeling when we were talking to them that sort of history was slipping through our fingers. Um, and so it was a great joy to be able to capture their stories. Yeah. Well, I think we also wanted um, to represent a sense of, you know, the different roles that, that women had, you know, played. Like where was motherhood and parenting through this whole, you know, series of time? And that became a really interesting theme because, you know, understanding that, yes, uh, you know, millions of women went to work but that question of what happens to the family, what happens to the children at that point. And we had incredible stories of how women banded together to make childcare possible. You know, they would, you know, three Rosies would live together in a house with their children and each take a separate shift so that one was sleeping, one was taking care of the kids and one was working. And then it was just constant. And it's like, it became this, this overall feeling of resiliency um, of yes, helping for the war. Yes, that pride and that patriotism, but really that, that banding together of, you know, how do we make this work? Yeah, it's, it's very interesting because, you know, even today, we still don't quite have it right, do we? You know, um, we want women in the workforce, but we're not, you know, um, giving them what they need um, outside of that to make that, uh, you know, uh, uh, effective and, um, you know, and alleviate some of the emotional and, and um, you know, psychological um, pressure uh, from all of that. So, you know, what, what you're telling me, Kirsten, then is it, it sounds like, it, you know, they, they were pioneers not only in the factories, but they were they were sort of social pioneers behind the scenes and what it was that they were putting together um, in the off hours on the home, you know, the home home front uh, for, for these women. And, um, you know, that's that's really uh, it's a very compelling uh, part of the story. Now, I want to step away from that for just a minute, because the film, as as folks saw, is just so interesting. It happens at so many levels. Um, you know, it, it's amazing to, you know, you're, you're, you're getting this fantastic story, but it's amazing to realize you're getting this fantastic story by a bunch of people made out of ripped cardboard. Um, <laughs> and it's just, it, it's just so captivating and engaging and it draws you in. But the film um, really takes place at so many levels. Can you talk a little bit about how that came about? Like, how did, how did you guys, yeah. you know, decide to pull that together and, and make it so multi-leveled. Well, you know, rich. thank you for that. Um, I mean, we really, so we had all these interviews and we had these amazing stories, but really all we had were sort of talking head um, video of these older women telling the stories. And we really struggled with, okay, how do we bring them to life? Like we didn't want to do a traditional film where we would, you know, pan to still photographs and, do archival. We didn't have a lot of archival of these particular women. We had maybe a photograph or two of them from the time. And we really wanted to make them feel alive, not for audiences now, but also for younger audiences now. We wanted to find a medium that would engage young women and girls in these stories. And we kind of came across the idea um, of using animation to actually bring the memories to life so that we would still have the women's voices. They would still be telling their own stories, but we would be watching something that was, that was more metaphoric, that was, that was more fictionalized. Um, and, uh, and so that's sort of how we came across the idea. And we didn't know what kind of animation we wanted to use. And so the first thing we did was we actually held a, um, an animation workshop 
with four different female animators because we knew we wanted to work with women animators because you know women are underrepresented in the animation world. Makes sense, yeah. Um, and so we we did this workshop with these four animators who were all brilliant and very different, very different styles, very different generations themselves. Um, and Danielle Ash, who's the woman who animated the girl with the rivet gun, was one of those women that we brought in. And we just fell in love with her sort of make the maker aspect of her cardboard puppetry, the sort of mechanics of it. Um, and we just thought it would be the perfect world to sort of bring the factories to life. Um, yeah. And I've seen the film now probably close to two dozen times. And um, almost every time I see it, I learn something new or I notice something something else. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's there's so much going on visually, uh, but tell us about the music. The music is just fantastic in and of itself. How did you get yeah. the music for this? I'm gonna give that to Anne because yeah. she she really, when she was editing, she really did a lot of uh, research and work on that. Yeah, I mean, the music is, um, you know, we listened to a lot of period music from the time um, and we, we knew we wanted to uh, to evoke that same those same feelings and those same um, uh, music is a very complicated thing because it's very emotional and it drives a lot of the emotion. We ended up working with a couple of a couple of different ways. Some of the music in the film is public domain. Some of it is actually like the Army Marching Band. Um, some of it is uh, is sort of uh, by a, a another wonderful female composer that we know, Michelle Debucci. Um, who uh, opened her library to us and she had made a number of pieces that were based on 1940s music. Um, and then uh, and then we worked with some of the music that's more sort of documentary score that's a little bit sort of more open and not quite as specific to the time frame uh, we got from another source. So you really kind of pull the musical world together, um, you know, and it's it was a, it was a really fun process to do that. Um, so yeah, yeah, and I, I would say, too, like one of the things always in documentaries, um, other films, too, or projects as, as well. But, you know, you you have a budget. Right. And it's never a lot. <laughs> so these are passion projects. And, you know, you're making trying to make the smartest, most layered decisions you can artistically within the budget that you have. And so we knew we had to, to work with. Um, you know, uh, public domain work in terms of music, um, in terms of some of the photographs and things like that, because we didn't have a, you know, a, a, a super high budget or anything. But I think oftentimes I love those moments because you really have to think, push yourself to think even more creatively of, you know, how can, how can we do this within, you know, a very small budget? Yeah, no, absolutely. Because you've got, you've got the narration, you've got the music, and then you've got the sounds of the machines, and then you've got the sounds of the sort of um, you know the, the bosses and the other guys and, and stuff in the in the um, and it really is very full and thick without without overdoing it, but all all pointed at that that focus of telling the story and and drawing the the, uh, the viewer in. Right, and then the the sound design was way more important for this project even than the music. Um, if you saw a copy, if you saw a version of the film without the sound effects in, it was a very different experience. We worked with a phenomenal sound designer named Andrea Bella, who, again, on our all woman team, um, who came in and created all of the sounds that you hear, all of the factory sounds. We did this recording session where we brought about, I don't know, what, there were like eight or nine of us together into a recording studio to do all those little background voices that you hear in the background. Um, right. You know, and so it's a very, it's a, it's a joyous and yet very complex um, uh, process of pulling all of that together. Um, and it was really like as, as, as much time and energy went into the, to the sound as almost anything else. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And I would say, Jeff, that, you know, because animation takes so long, right? Especially, you know, this style of animation, which is stop motion. So Danielle was, you know, moving and, you know, filming, you know, yeah. every single movement is a single shot and then it's put together. So it's, it's, it's hundreds and hundreds of hours to do this. And, but I do think we would do certain sessions and then have the opportunity to adjust the script for the next piece or, you know, really talk about those layers of themes in a way, you know, that if you were saying, 
you know, okay, we need to do this all in four weeks. Let's go, go, go. Um, you know, it might not have gotten the depth, um, but the fact that we were really building this piece over the course of a couple of years was, I think, really advantageous to where the story ended up in terms of depth. So other than other than budget, what do you think was the biggest challenge you had to you had to overcome? I mean, it's a it's an incredible team you put together. There's got to be, you know, there's so many moving parts to, to putting this all together. What was the, the biggest challenge other, other than budget? Because that's always going to be. You know, we never have enough. No. Yeah. That's a hard question to answer. I mean, I think that part of it is the time, which is connected to budget, but it's a little bit different. It's sort of like, you know, pulling together people to work on something that is this multi-layer, that has this many. It's it's sort of like you, you know, you've got this this car that you're building as you're driving it down the road. Um, emotionally, for me, one of the hardest things was the stories that we couldn't include. You know, that as you're trying to tell, you, you, you're not going to tell the definitive Rosie story. Right. Um, but, you know, there's stories in there that I really wish we could have told. Um, there was a woman we interviewed who um, had a very controlling, abusive father. Yeah. And, um, and she was, you know, she was 18 years old. She was trying to get out of the house. And she told the story that she would go and get a job, like she'd get a job at the local bank, I think is the first one that she told us. And her father would go down and get her fired and bring her home and lock her up. But here's the thing, during wartime, if you signed a work contract, you couldn't get fired from war work. You couldn't, so that was how she got out of, away from her father, was that she went and she got a job for the war effort. And that job was, it, she couldn't, he couldn't break it. Um, and so it's this kind of like, you don't even think about the fact that it's not just the economic freedom, but it's the, it's this idea of actually having, being considered a whole person by the society and being able to make your own decisions. And so that's a story I would have loved to include um, in what we did, but there just wasn't room. Yeah, it seems like this idea of of uh, 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 of having control and agency, and you know, um, you know, the the ability to sort of cast your own lot in life and and move it, you know, forward. Even even though you're working within the confines of of this broader thing, which of course um, uh, is the war. Now, Kirsten, you you mentioned a few minutes ago about um, the the love that these women put into the work. And um, I want to share that that little clip, um, which I think really shows, uh, you know, how attached these women got to what it was that they were they were doing. So let's take a, a, a little look at that. I worked at Woodall Industry in Detroit. I made the Curtis Wright Hell Diver, which was a dive bomber that traveled on ships and then bombed from the ships. Pilots didn't really like to fly them, but when they went out, they knew they were coming back because they were serviceable. They'd get shot up every which way, and then they'd almost always get back to the ship with them. But when they got back to the ship, and here's my tearjerker, they'd push them off in the, in the ocean. Because I couldn't stand it when they'd say they'd push my hell diver off in the ocean, but they weren't fit to fly again. But it really did hurt to think my hell diver was going in the ocean. Wow, I, I can almost feel her, uh, you know, her disappointment in, uh, you know, knowing that those planes are, are at the bottom of the ocean after all that, uh, all that hard, that hard work. Um, so when you were talking with these women, what do you think was the, the, the takeaway that they got, um, you know, initially in this time that they were working in the factories and, and you know, earning the money and, and having that sense of control and that sense of, of freedom to, you know, buy extra clothing or shoes or those sorts of things. And then um, what do you think that they, uh, looking back on it now, almost 75 years, how, has anything changed in that? Did they, did they talk at all about uh, anything like that? I think to your point earlier, Jeff, about agency, that is something that really came through um, in different ways for so many of the different women, you know, like I remember one woman who 
you know, felt so amazing to be able to save the money from her paychecks and contribute in such a large way to the down payment of buying a house when, you know, her husband returned. I mean, they, they had double the money to be able to do that. And that was, that felt really great to her. So I think that agency in that moment, but then, you know, we had the experience of being with this women, these women so many decades later, and you know how memory you know, changes and shifts and and how you feel about things grows. And that was a really profound experience because, um, you know, and I think Anne says this too, I mean, who, who does society listen to the least? Elderly women. And to have these moments of this special time where we're dedicated these hour or two hour sessions, you know, you just, they have so much to give and so much experience. And I think overwhelmingly, um, I don't know what you would say, Anne, but I feel like the camaraderie, like that time during their their rosy time, this sense of being out, having agency, but developing these relationships and these communities um, really, really stuck with them. So I just always found that beautiful in so many of the, the women we talked to. Definitely. Great. Now, what what would you say is the um, the takeaway for the audience? Now, when, when you guys were, were putting this together, obviously it's a labor of love, and you know you're getting these great stories, and you're wrestling with how you're going to tell this, and you know which stories are going to be representative. Um, but take a step to the other side of the screen for those of us that are watching the film. What did you want us to walk away with? What, what was the takeaway for us? Do you think? Well, I, I mean, I think there's a lot of things we hope that people will get from it. I mean, one is really to empower um, women and young girls to sort of challenge their role in the society, to, to challenge what's expected of them and what they might be able to do. We still have very few women in STEM professions. We still have very few women that go into engineering. Um, or So just to challenge women to say that, they, you know, we really have to push back against these non-traditional jobs. Like, you follow that dream of what you want to do. One of the things that came across from a lot of the women is the sense of, like, you know, the war for them and the employment for them, it was this amazing occasion to rise to, that they could rise to. But, you know, I think that when we don't have that occasion to rise to sometimes, we don't push, the society doesn't push for change. And I think that, you know, that push has to come from us. It has to come, um, we have to make those opportunities for ourselves. Um, you know, and obviously we're, you know, on the edge of some very scary times in the world right now. And, you know, it, 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 we need to reach we need to reach for a better world and part of that better world is making more space for everyone inside of it you know so that's the sort of the takeaway and the other takeaway for me is like you look at someone some nice little old lady on the street and you don't know what her life has been you don't know what she's been through um, and that everybody has a story and those stories are worth hearing and they're worth telling mm -hmm. And I would just say that I'll, I'll tell a story about, um, so I have a son who's now 11 and in his uh, third grade, right when COVID was shutting down, they were in their social studies starting to, um, you know, talk about World War II and, you know, just watching how much of that history is through pictures and the narrative of a male gaze and a male perspective. And so I approached the teacher. I said, hey, can can we play for the class this rosy film? And, you know, for third graders at this point, you know, the recognition of, you know, women didn't wear pants before this pervasively. Like all of these great questions that just enrich your sense of history and um, the complexity of moments. I mean, I really just hope that generations can, you know, look at that poster and take that step beyond and say, you know, that use their own curiosity to fuel towards a greater understanding. So. Yeah, it's the, the poster says we, we can do it. And, you know, what it should really say is you've got to do it. And you've got to make the way, make your own space for this. You know, the, the crisis very often will create the opportunity, but then once the crisis passes, the complacency comes back, and you know we, we tend to forget that we need to keep uh, keep pushing and keep moving. And you know, Kirsten, I'm really glad you mentioned um, 
your son's class because that's the fun part that I'm going to love about this. Um, you know, I get to make uh, some curriculum to go along with this. And uh, I haven't started yet, but I can't wait to get started. And um, it's going to be um, just a, a joy to work with the raw material um, that, that you guys have, have provided for us. And I know that we're going to get this out in front of thousands of, of young, uh, young people, young girls, young boys um, across the country and around the world. And, you know, let them know that, um, you know, every story that you see, as you just said, Anne, everybody has a story, but every story that you see is far more complicated than you realize, you know, on the, on the surface. We all have our own movies going on in our, in our head. And, um, you know, you guys have just done a fantastic job of, of putting those together, uh, you know, in this, in this little package. So what advice would you have um, for budding filmmakers or, um, you know, documentarians or young scholars, um, you know, that, that you've learned over the years of, of working uh, in the fields that you guys have worked in? Any advice? Um, I would say that, you know, to always tell the stories that interest you, um, to, you know, your, your sense of curiosity is your best guide into, into what, you know, if you make a film that you're interested in watching, chances are other people are going to be interested in watching it. And the other thing just to say to, especially young documentary and not documentarians, um, <laughs> is that it's this incredible honor to be given, to be entrusted with someone else's story. And I always say that like the scariest audience for us when we're making a film is always the people who are in it. Um, did we get it right? Did we represent their experience truthfully? Um, does it feel to them like their story? Um, so just to remember that when you're making stories about real people, um, it, it's a privilege and it's a joy. Um, and also the other advice is don't count on making a living. <laughs> you know, do, it, do it because you love doing it um you know do it because you love doing it yeah so. and have lots of gigs on the side yeah absolutely yeah. yeah well that's the same thing with education we always say you don't go into education for the income you go into education for the outcome yes and, uh, and the impact like that. You're, you're able to make so what is um what is next for you guys? I can't wait to see uh you know what what you got coming down the pike is there something in the process something in the works What's, what's yeah. next? So we are just finishing um, a about a 40 minute uh, documentary film that we've been working on for five years. So we have been um, after our feature film, which won the Emmy in, I think, 2015. Um, we were approached uh, to make a film about this gentleman who is a former uh, police officer who grew up in a house of domestic violence and who now is working very deeply um, with innovative reforms in, um, in police for reform around domestic violence and sexual assault. And it's really his personal beautiful story of how his you know, traumatic memory and journey has um, really propelled him in this huge mission forward and making it better for, for women everywhere, so. It's really, so that will be out sometime, hopefully um, in film festivals in 2022 or 2023. Oh, not, not too much longer then really. No, no. That's great. Um, wow, that's that's a powerful um, story you guys have got to tell with that. And I, I just, uh, seeing what you've done with the with the Rosie story, I know that that story is in good and capable, uh, capable hands. Mm -hmm. So um, is there anything else you guys wanted to say to folks before we uh, call it a day here? No, just that it's like a total joy for the film. Uh, you know, the film opens with Eleanor Roosevelt, um, and it's a real joy to be um, to be working with the Library Museum on this kind of programming. Um, so we're really excited. Yeah, we couldn't think of a better home for it. So yeah. thank you. Well, we are delighted that uh, that you've given us the opportunity to be a part of this, and uh, like I say, it's going. To, I'm going to be writing some curriculum for this. It's going to become part of our um, our educational offerings and such. And um, we're going to have you guys back. Um, we're going to have you guys back sometime later this year, um, maybe uh, in person, which would be awesome. Um, and um, those of you that are out there watching, keep uh, keep posted on what we've got going on because. We're going to have these uh, these two you know talented, wonderful filmmakers back again to talk more about this film, more about what they've got um, 
you know, in the works. And just this idea of, of storytelling, you know, it really, really is so important. And, you know, and you just said something that was was quite touching to me is that, you know, when you're telling the story with these with these rosies that are still there, you know, you really have to make sure you get it right because, um, you know, they're here now to see that, but they're going to be gone, you know, quite, uh, quite soon, you know, um, you know, just the way things, you know, uh, progress and such. So um, it, now is the time to get it right. Now is the time to, to do it. And you guys have just done a fantastic job with that. So I want to thank you for making the film. I want to thank, thank you for you. sharing it with us here at the library. I want to thank you for your time, um, you know, with us today. And uh, we look forward to uh, down the line when we get back together and, and can explore this in, in, in uh, even greater detail. Thank you, Jeff. It's really good. Well, thanks for joining us today, ladies and gentlemen. And if you'd like to learn more about uh, issues from the Roosevelt era, you can visit our website at fdrlibrary.org. You also might want to check out our educational material on our Four Teachers for Educators page on the website. We have a great number of curriculum guides there on a wide variety of Roosevelt topics, and there's always plenty more that you can learn. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.